speaker is Christopher J. Fromm. Chris Fromm, he's the assistant <coughs> university archivist and assistant professor of library administration at the University of Illinois Urbana Champaign, where he's responsible for managing digital projects, supervising archival processes, and excuse me, processing and record scheduling, providing reference services, and are you still working on the AOA collection? Mm -hmm. Working with the American, so uh, American Library Association archives. Um, Chris is going to be speaking, as you can see, about more product less process um, in their institution, and so that's a little bit of change from the um, agenda that we posted earlier. Um, so, Good morning, everyone, and uh, just like to, to thank you, Alex, for uh, posting this, for getting this together. Um, it, it's great to see these kind of events where we're sharing ideas, where we're doing a lot online, and I, I'd like to especially thank um, uh, both Sam and Erica for describing what they're doing at their institutions. I'm going to talk about, a, I wouldn't say a different approach, but certainly a complementary approach um, that we've taken. Actually, a lot of the topics that they talked about, doing disk imaging, getting responsible custody over materials, um, really, really uh, good fundamental processes to get in place, using some of the, the types of tools with disk imaging, forensics, uh, topic, uh, I should say digital humanities software, all those kinds of things are directions we're heading. Um, but what I would like to do is situate our program a little bit more broadly within our uh, entire suite of problems that we face at the, at, at the University of Illinois, and specifically in some problems um, you know, that we've had to, to, to encounter. I actually thought about titling this talk, as you, as you saw in the original um, agenda that was distributed, What I Learned the Hard Way About Digital Preservation. And I'd like to just start off here with a little bit of a story. Uh, Alex didn't talk about this, but I actually wasn't trained in any kind of digital preservation field, or in fact, in library science. Um, I was hired as an archivist, as a historian. I was trained as a history PhD student. Uh, about the time that I discovered there were no history PhD jobs, I, I applied to become an archivist at the University of Illinois. And the first job that was given to me was to take a set of um, uh, technologies that we had developed uh, for, for controlling descriptive information. This was an access database. We had an old uh, R-based computer database file. We had WordPerfect files. And I was supposed to bring all of this stuff together into one system this back in 1999. Um, the lesson I learned from that project is it's actually very, very hard um, to mess digital preservation up so badly that you can never recover from it. Um, the reason I learned this is because the first thing I did was actually delete the entire database from the American Library Association archives. 25 years of descriptive effort gone. Um, and, and I got it back. And I, I like to tell that story because, um, you know, A, I was really panicked about it. I thought I had just worked my way out of a job. Right? You know, here they were trusting this guy that didn't know anything about computers. But what it demonstrated to me actually is that most of the time uh, there's actually a backup to something. If you understand a minimal amount about how the systems you're operating with work, you really can do a pretty good job of digital preservation. I certainly found that to be the case as well with the tools that we're using um, to do digital preservation work now. We tend to be a lot better. Whenever we're going to undertake any digital preservation effort, the first thing we do, um, whether it's a disk image, whether it's something that comes to us from a thumb drive, is we put a copy away. We never touch that copy again. It sits there. We make copies of it, and we work with those copies of the material. So as part of my talk here, I'd just like to focus on some very practical things that, that can be done. Um, to work with digital materials. Now, we all kind of have these horror stories, right? I mean, the, the donor sets the um, you know, bag of, uh, of goodies from Kroger on the desk, and, and you have to work through all these discs that are in the plastic bag. I don't know if you can see this here, but this is a typical faculty office. 
um, for a deceased faculty member at the University of Illinois. You can't quite see it, but down in the, in the bottom, um, I guess that would be, uh, let's see, right hand corner of the screen, appropriately enough in the shadows, are, is a box full of about, oh, two or three hundred discs, you know, um, covered in dust and all kinds of things. And then the question is, well, what are you going to do with this material? And it seems like a very challenging, challenging process at first. Using some of the types of things uh, that, that Sam and Erica talked about, you can get data off of there. But we actually found that most of the data we got from this particular office came simply by booting up this desktop computer, uh, looking through it, and finding that actually he had copied most of the material from those floppy drives onto his, onto his desktop computer. So always start with, with what um, is the easiest thing to do. Now, at Illinois, we had gotten to a point, um, that, again, Alex didn't mention this, probably because I forgot to put it in my bio, but we had gotten to a point about, um, I would say, six, seven years ago where we realized we had a digital preservation problem. The problem was simply that people kept giving us stuff and we kept promising to take care of it and we really weren't doing a very good job of it. So somebody would take it, somebody would hand us a bunch of CDs or a thumb drive or whatever and we said, oh, well, we'll take that. We put it on a network file server somewhere, um, you know, gave it a nice um, folder title, something like, um, you know, Tim's files or, um, you know, files from Karen's thumb drive or something like that. And uh, anyway, I started looking through this and, and I, I ran some, I, you know, you can right click folders. So I right clicked the folder that all this stuff was in. And after the computer thought for about 45 minutes, it decided that that was like three terabytes of stuff that we had been given over the years. So obviously we had a really big problem. Um, I was thinking a little bit about this and I don't know how many of you listening online or how many of you are archivists or familiar with this, but probably the most influential article that's come out in the past several years was written by uh, Mark Green and Dennis Meister, talking about the more uh, product, less process approach to physical collections. And we really needed this for digital collections as well. So what I ended up doing was, uh, that luckily, as, a, as a, a faculty member at the library, I got to the point where I had hung around long enough, so I was eligible for a sabbatical. So I thought, well, I'll spend a year studying the theory of digital preservation. So, so that's kind of what I went off and did, looked at all the all theory, and but let's try to come up with a more process, less, uh, a more product, less process approach to digital preservation. Okay, so I got this nice sabbatical. I thought, okay, I'm going to try to understand the archival information system, open archival information system reference model. Um, some of you may be familiar with this. It's a standard that was developed by actually space scientists. So my, my friend William Kilbride, who's the director of the Digital Preservation Coalition um, over, over in Scotland says, you know, this problem, you know this problem was complex because NASA started to look at it and they had to call in their European buddies to help them out. Um, so anyway, it was put together by something called a consultative uh, uh, system for data uh, space science systems or something like that. Anyway, this basically uh, is a high level model describing how an archive should work for digital materials. And if you look at that, it's a very scary diagram. And, you know, you can spend a lot of time reading about the standard. Um, but there's really very, at the end of the day, there's really a relatively small amount you need to do about that. Um, after I had gone off and read a lot of this digital preservation literature, um, you know, I was starting to get a little bored just reading technical manuals and things like that. So I picked up, uh, you know, another book. And I, I've always liked Eric Fromm. And I, I, I came across this quote um, about the process of learning and art. And I, I really do think, you know, he's talking here about something a little bit more um, interesting than digital preservation, which is what it means to love another person. But I do think you can apply this in the same respect because I've certainly found that you need to know a little bit about digital preservation. Um, but to get started, you really learn the most when you begin practicing it based on some very solid fundamental principles. 
So if you take some fundamental principles from the theory and begin working those out uh, around real collections, working with real donors, and, and talking um, through particular problems that you face, you begin to make a lot more um, process with things. So um, if there's a key point that I've, I've found over the years uh, of working with these, these types of records is learn about the theory. Um, in fact, I don't have a, a citation for this here, but I did list what I think are some particularly useful resources that people could look at um, on my blog. If you, if you Google me, you'll find I have a blog called Practical E-Records. And just this morning, I put up a post listing some types of resources that you can use if you're just getting started with digital preservation. So learn a little bit about that. Um, but really, focus on the problem in front of you and take some of those resources and put them uh, to bear. And some in particular that I'll mention are, are very helpful. Um, I've taken a lot of the digital archive specialist courses through the Society of American Archivists. Those are really, really good. Um, and then I will also do a little bit of a plug here um, for the Society of American Archivists Trends in Archives Practice Series, which has a book relating to arrangement and description in the digital age. The particular part that I think is useful in there is in part one that was written by Gordon Danes, who's an archivist at Brigham Young, about processing foreign digital records and manuscripts. This is a really good work. Um, we don't have time necessarily, given our institutional profile. I don't have time to process foreign digital materials myself. I'm out talking to donors a lot. I'm working on library um, committee uh, meetings. I'm doing all kinds of other things. We found that by giving this article to our students, graduate students, they're able to get a pretty good fundamental grasp on, on what needs to be done to, to, or to you know, uh, process more digital records. What I always uh, start from whenever we're looking at a collection is it's helpful for me at least, to keep in mind what we're trying to do as an archivist uh, with these records that we're acquiring. Um, the critical point about this, you know, like I was saying before, I started off as an archivist, uh, not having any training in archives. Well, if you look at the definition of archives, it places a lot of emphasis on this idea that the records should be preserved in a way that provides, um, uh, preserves their value as evidence of the existence, functions, and operations of the institution or the organization that generated them. So if you're coming to preserving digital materials that have been given to you as a librarian or as an archivist, it's important to keep this part in mind about evidence because um, it, it, frankly, it took me a long time as an, even as an archivist to understand what this really means. But in practice, all the records that you receive will be generated by some activity that a person undertook. So for example, um, you know, they may be, uh, as a research scientist, doing a research project. So we want to preserve those records in a way that doesn't um, uh, disarrange them or disorder them in any way or make them more difficult for, for people to use. So, so always keeping in mind this thing that we want to document, activities behind the records not just keep the records themselves. Um, fundamentally, um, as I had gone through the sabbatical, as I had been thinking about developing this sort of more process, less, uh, more product, less process approach, a couple of questions came to my mind as really fundamental, which is, as an archivist, what do I really need to do, and what does my institution really need to do to do these four things? take custody over digital materials, um, preserve them in a way that we can give them to somebody and they can view them or make sense out of them, uh, retain the value that they have as evidence of some kind of activity that led to their being created. So to take an example, um, email records, we want to preserve them in a way so that people can tell who the recipient was when they've been sent. Uh, research data files, we want to preserve them in a way so that uh, a, a user can look at them and say, oh yes, this file was created for X, Y, or Z purpose. And then finally, allow people to judge their authenticity. At the end, um, it, 
those are all complex questions, but what we actually need to do at a macro level to preserve, to, to meet those needs is actually a lot less than you think. Um, as an archivist, I always go back to thinking about needing to preserve uh, information about these four pieces of what we call recordness. You know, every record of activity has these four things to them. There's content. So if somebody turns a disk over to you or you capture an image, that's the content you're wanting to preserve. And all the start, the stuff that you do to preserve that content is really important. But unless you also think critically about preserving some information about the context that led to the creation of those records, the structure of those records and their relationships to other, to, the, to each other and to records from other people and the function that those records play, you haven't really preserved enough to, to give the user um, what they need to do to make those records accessible. So in our broader system, we try to make sure that for each set of records that's turned over to us, we preserve the content, context about them, the structure of the records, and um, some evidence about their function or the, uh, the role that they play. As an archivist, everything that we do comes down to provenance. So this is basically the principle of archival um, work that says everything from a single records creator should be kept together as a whole. Uh, you know, we don't, and we always want to show where the records came from. So within our system, we really play, pay a lot of attention on proper classification of an entire group of records. Not so much about individual files, but about the groupings and the relations. So in our, um, this uh, more product, less process approach that I'll describe in a minute, I was looking at these five things that we do and they're actually similar to what, probably the same as what um, Sam and uh, Erica are doing. We want to make sure that we take custody in a responsible fashion. What that means in terms of the uh, open archival information system reference model is we take in this thing called a submission information packet. You know, OAS, if you look at the reference model, has a lot of fancy words. One of them is ingesting. Um, basically, it just means taking custody over something in a responsible way and beginning to feed it into your preservation system. Also critical for us when we receive the material in consultation with the donor is coming up with some kind of plan to make it accessible. Uh, one of the things that we found very effective at the point when we take custody is having a simple checklist that we give to the donor. Donors are almost always concerned about privacy issues. They know that there's gonna be some things in there that they don't wanna make accessible. We simply provide them a checklist telling them what we're going to do with the materials, um, promising that we will, uh, that they'll have the opportunity to remove any personal materials themselves, but then asking them for some advice in terms of how to uh, identify things that might be private. So we have a checklist. Um, I, there's actually an example of this on my blog, and I'll, I'll refer to it in a minute. We use that as part of a processing plan for the records. Um, the arrangement and descriptions step can be, um, as Erica noted, either relatively simple or fairly complex depending on the nature of the records. Sometimes it requires very little. Um, we take a copy, we know the files are clean, there's no viruses, we run virus checks, we uh, look at it to see if there's private information, if there isn't. We see that copyright is owned by the university or the donor has given us copyright permission in the deed of gift to make it accessible. So we're able to do that. In other cases, it's much more complex and we will use a variety of tools, uh, mainly desktop applications to examine the files and then remove whatever needs to be removed for privacy reasons. Other critical element is having a storage solution in place, however imperfect it is. Um, you know, I work for a very, large institution, the University of Illinois, and we have available to us quite a bit of computing technology, but at the end of the day, all I really have accessible to me as well is a big file storage pot somewhere sitting on the file system. So each archives will have to have a place to put materials. 
similarly to how you need to have you know stacks to put things into or a shelving unit find a convenient spot to put it in make sure it's backed up and uh, use that uh, to go forward and then we have a certain set of rough and ready access tools that we develop so critical for me and at least in, in for illinois in thinking about what we need to preserve is coming to grips with this idea from the uh, from the Open Archival Information System Reference Model, known as the Archival Information Packet. This is a conceptual model that describes everything you need to uh, preserve in order to uh, show authenticity for the files over the long run. There's content information, there's this stuff called preservation description information, which is the premise metadata and other metadata that um, was referred to previously. And then there's descriptive information about the records themselves. Um, in practical terms, this archival information packet, we think of as a logical unit relating to an entire collection of materials, including both the original files turned over to us and any access derivatives that we made. So in our system, what we do is we put together in our catalog uh, a digital object descriptive record in our content management system structured according to the um, recommendations for describing archives that are given in DAX, which is Describing Archives of Content Standard. We link that description in our, in our uh, system to the content data, to the technical metadata, and to whatever administrative metadata we have about it. And uh, since we're a very high volume operation, we have you know, these multiple terabytes, we found that we've been able to by handling all of the description through one simple digital object record in our catalog, bring under control about four or five hundred collections of digital material representing eight or nine terabytes of data. Okay, so we're not doing perfect description here. We're not even doing good description necessarily, but we're doing good enough description so that people can find things, have information about it, contact the archives, get access to it, and we can work with them to help them get, um, get access going. What we found is absolutely critical is using the systems we already have in place. Um, one of my colleagues once tried to convince me that we should set up a, a parallel infrastructure for doing arrangement and description of more digital materials to complement that which we use for physical materials. Um, luckily, I didn't listen to this piece of advice because I think it would have been absolutely disastrous. Um, we just use the systems we have in place. We use our existing catalog, we use our existing file system. We use tools we have accessible to us. On a case-by-case -case basis, we will experiment with tools like I have a collection right now. We're going to do some really sophisticated topic um, analysis using digital humanities topic modeling software. But that's all add-on on the top of the basic stuff that gets done just using our collection management system. So as long as you have these pieces in place, a way to accept materials, a collection management system to describe them in, a place to store files, and a way to give access to users, you can kind of build out your own um, system uh, as, you, as you need it. So, University of Illinois Archives, we have about 26,000 cubic feet of materials under management now. I don't have it up here, but we have about eight terabytes or so of either born digital or digitized content available. It includes the records of the organization itself, obviously the University of Illinois. We have a large number of faculty and alumni papers, as well as external archives like the American Library Association archives held on contract. If you look at the library IT infrastructure that we have, um, I had a slide in here at one point, I called this both feast and famine, because in one sense we have access to a lot. I have, as a file server storage um, layer, I have access to a 10 terabyte drive to store materials and to stage them for deposit into our preservation repository. But I don't have direct access to a programming staff or a system engineer. Um, what we do have is a collection management system that we developed in-house several years ago. Uh, this is a web application 
um, is currently in the process. It's kind of at the end of its life right now, and we'll eventually we'll migrate the data from it into archive space, which is a new application. But basically, by using these two pieces of software, our collection management system, file server storage, and then depending on what particular collection needs exist, we're able to generate, uh, to, to do the preservation of the original files that were given, whether it's a disk image or just a thumb drive or whatever, um, and then generate access copies, store all of it, and provide access to it through our um, uh, user interface. Okay, so this is just another way of saying this is a big problem we face and a lot of other people do. We have acquired a lot without an informal plan for ongoing management. So when we had this three terabytes, we knew we needed to get uh, you know, it under control. Uh, all this stuff had come into us through a variety of ways over the years. Um, you know, people don't necessarily like you coming in and, and plugging you know, fancy equipment into their computer or taking disk images. They don't always want to, um, you know, give the equipment to you to bring it into the archives. When we can do that, it's great. I'm very fortunate to have access to a digital preservation coordinator who has wonderful technology, can come in, uh, grab disk images off of donors' computers and whatnot. But when they don't want to do that, we'll basically take the files however people can get them to us and are willing to give them to us. So, you know, I've had people do everything from send them to me through Dropbox, box.com, via email on disk. The important thing I found is to be very upfront with, with um, donors of material as to what you're going to be doing with the records. We've had a lot of concerns in particular about preserving correspondence, particularly email. As an archivist, I know that that's where the really good stuff lies, where quite honestly, we're going to have people 30 years from now wanting to research what's been going on at the university or what our faculty have been up to. What we found very effective, actually, is by putting, it, if we're going to be taking email or more digital records in, attaching an addendum to our deed of gift, which tells donors essentially what we're going to be doing with the records and giving them uh, the opportunity to provide us some information about materials that they think have some kind of concern that should be addressed. We've also begun to do this with um, records that we're, that we're not taking in. You can probably be able to see this very well. But university records that are not being taken in through a deed of gift, but through a simple transfer process under records management. Um, you know, so we have senior administrators. We know that their email should be preserved because it's the historical record of decisions taken at the university. But they don't want to just give us willy-nilly access to their account, right? Um, so what we ended up doing was developing a simple email transfer form where we inform them of the principles of management that we'll be using in managing those materials, help them give us an idea as to how we should remove materials that need to be restricted for privacy concerns, confidentiality concerns, or whatever. If you go to my website, you can see a copy of that form. We found that these donor relation issues are actually one of the trickier things uh, to manage, but by using some fairly simple, straightforward forms, it, it, it can work very well. Um, so once the materials are acquired, um, it's critical, it has been critical for us to store and files consistently until they're processed. We have this 10 terabyte drive. We have an unprocessed folder. The files go in there. They're assigned an identifier. We create an accession record for them in our collections management system. And when we get ready to process them, we use whatever information is in the accession record as the basis for the processing plan. We've also found it's critical to develop a uh, structure for an archival information packet um, that's consistent. What we're going to be doing over the next six months or so is ingesting all of this material into a proper preservation repository, which has been developed by our preservation services um, unit on campus. And uh, we found it's critical to have an archival information packet structure that A maps to the collection level uh, description in our system, and B is, uh, is flexible at the lower levels, but has a, a very 
important level of consistency at the top level of the structure, and I'll, I'll explain what I mean by that in a minute. We've also found that it's been very critical for us to, to gain control of files at the aggregate level first. Um, I think both uh, Eric and Sam said, look, we're not doing item level description or analysis. We never do item level description or analysis. I, 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 I really like to avoid it. Um, so we just try to get control of things at the file level using a minimal but little, uh, rigorous level of consistency in storing and naming this archival information packet and then linking it to descriptive metadata. Something got messed up on the slide. But basically what I'm trying to illustrate here is here are the records for an individual. Um, we have one simple descriptive record in our database describing these files, which are 607 megabytes of files. On the right hand, uh, sorry, on the, yeah, on the right hand side, we have the archival information packet divided basically into um, three parts. We have the original files that were captured as the disk image. We have this preservation description information, which is any documentation about the files. It might be email correspondence between me and the donor. It might be a copy of the deed of gift. And then we have checksum values, which are generated at time of accession. And then the, credit, the other part of this is we have these process records in two folders. One is a copy that we prepared to go on our website. So if somebody wants to come and look at these, this is a very small set of records that we thought would provide a representative sample of the collection. And then we also have what we call a nearline copy which is uh, the portion that we would turn over to users in the reading room or give them access to in a zip file or something like that. So this entire 607 megabytes of files, this is it for the description of those files. And this is, like I say, MPLP, more product, less processed approach. Um, now in practice, the archivist at Illinois used to like used to say every inventory is preliminary. Well, this is very preliminary. Will we come back and ever do more description on it? We may. Uh, we may not. If we don't, at least we have it under a minimal level of control. So this is just a blown-out example for every collection, and we have not actually come across a case yet where we have just more digital materials. We almost always have print materials as well. So here's the description for the entire collection, 5.6 cubic feet of material. Links to this is a digital object record, which I showed in the previous page. If you look more closely at this, you can see there's a link to the online version of the files. And then we have some complementary material, which can be given through a zip file to users and administrative access to all of this archival information packet will be through our preservation repository, which is in the do um, This is just a simplified version of the archival information packet. So for each collection, we have this. A unique identifier linking into the descriptive record in our database. We have preservation description information. We have access copies. And we have the preservation file, which is what was originally turned over to us. So we can always go back to the copy, the original files, if we discover we made some um, error with the access copies. As far as access is concerned, um, I'm a big believer in just putting things out there if we know we can provide responsible access to them. What we actually, what we use in the majority of cases where we don't have uh, you know, a more sophisticated system is a simple file browser that we put online. So I copy this entire access copy over to the web server, and this file browser just generates this access interface for us. And uh, users can browse through these files, they can open them, you know, they might get confused by them because they might not necessarily know what um, is in there, uh, you know, and it, it, it may include things that don't necessarily open in their operating system. Um, but at least the files are accessible. Uh, now we've had to work through, you know, 300 collections using this method. 
And what we eventually ended up doing was setting up a simple tracking spreadsheet in Google Docs to do it. And as you can see, here's one row for that. I have a student creating descriptive records. I have another student generating the access and preservation copies. We talk to each other, and a good portion of my day consists of getting comments on Google Docs spreadsheets. Chris, what should I do about this that issue? Um, so as much as I'd like to have a formal processing plan for each of these, we, we haven't been able to do it in, in all cases. Okay, so here's just an example of the systems we're using. Um, as I point out, Archon for the descriptive metadata, file system storage, we have access tools and electronic records browser on our web server. One I did not mention, but that I've cited in my blog post is a gallery application that we use for um, large transfers of photographs. This particular tool will read meta, uh, metadata out of the header of the file and then build an interface using that metadata. Okay, these are some other examples I was going to cite. I'm not going to have time to do that. But each of these are interesting because they're very different. We have here records from a campus unit. Uh, the UI Histories one is an entire uh, uh, ecosystem of records, including a op Linux operating system, and we're preserving that through this system, just uh, providing a minimal level of description for it, and then uh, preserving the MySQL databases uh, in front of that end. Okay, so what we found, I'll bring it back here to Eric Fromm, is that you can only think about digital preservation so long. When you start doing it, you find it doesn't really have to be as complex as you think it is, and you can build layers um, on top of it. But start with the world, you know, try to grasp uh, hold of digital preservation issues using the tools you have accessible to you. And you're gonna make some mistakes, but in the end, it'll all work out, and you'll have a lot of fun doing it. I had a lot of fun doing digital preservation. Thank you. Only question on, oh, let me get into the microphone just so that people uh, watch it online. Uh, so you mentioned some uh, donors having trouble transferring over that material to trust issue. How do you deal with that if, you know, it's more of a transfer rather than a deed of gift, convincing them it's okay to give us, give us the digital files? Yeah, it's, it's an, I mean, it's, it's really interesting. Um, I mean, it's, it's probably the part of archival work that's the most that's both the most difficult and can be the most fun. Um, I, the, the archivist that founded the University of Illinois Archives had this wonderful saying he used to, to come to us with, which was, the archivist should be out of his office 80%, this was a time when archivists were all men, should be out of his office 80% of the time. And, and I, I really think a lot of it boils down to that. If, if you're not visible in a way that, um, people relate to you and have worked with you in the past, there's really no way they're going to turn files over to you. Um, or that they're going to be very reluctant to do it. So um, what we found very effective is um, this email transfer form. So we had a couple of missteps, actually, where we went to people and said, hey, will you give us our email? We didn't really have a pre-existing relationship with them. So at that point, we went back and did a lot, did a lot of um, talking to people around campus, saying, well, what do you really want to preserve? You know, um, what, what portion of your records is worth preserving? And here are the principles we, we will use to manage it. And you have to be very careful with that. I mean, one of our principles, we thought it was great, was we will remove private information, personal records from your email. And I, I thought this was great, but then when we started talking with people about it, they're like, we don't like this we part. We want to take that private stuff out ourselves, right? So it, it just, it's a lot of conversation. Um, this is really what it, what it boils down to. Yeah. But there's a, this whole personal aspect of acquiring these materials is really, really important. No real questions online, but although there is a request, if you could go back to the slide that has the link to the e records form. Uh, to the form? This? I, I believe it's that slide. Okay. Third. 
any other questions here in the bridge? Actually, I have one. Oh. <laughs> and so what kind of platform do you use to provide access to email? Do you keep it in that same format, or do you use PDFs? Yeah, email is uh, email's particularly tricky. Um, we, uh, yeah, the one project I didn't talk about yet is an extensive email component to it. Um, more or less what we're planning on doing with that is converting it to a, to a sem semi-standard based <coughs> format, which would be inbox um, format, and then providing access to it on an account basis. Um, and so it would be, okay, here's a copy of it, you know, in the short term at least, let's mold it into, um, a, and we'll have, in, our, in the new space we're moving into, we'll have a dedicated workstation so people can use more digital materials. So we'll probably have, you know, like a basic email client like Outlook on there. So we would just mold it in there and they can use it that way. Um, longer term, I'm much more interested in seeing what comes out of the EPAD project that Stanford University is, is running. I see both Sam and Eric nodding their heads here. But they're actually using some of these digital humanities type tools to do things like um, develop a tool that you can sit down with donors to help identify private information or you know, social security numbers, doctor's appointments, all that kind of stuff, and then either redact it or remove it from the collection. There is, um, in that project, being built an access tool as well. They're probably about a year or two away from that portion of the project, but um, it's, it's getting started, so that would be the, my long-term hope, I guess, is that that provides a good platform. And I was, at a, I was at a meeting about three weeks ago where they presented, and it looks like it's really a, a really great project.